I wanted to thank very much for this invitation to what I consider the country of intelligence. And I was really amazed to hear that there was a university here before there was a country. Had we Italians gotten here first, there would have been a restaurant before. <laughs> Well, presumably. <laughs> um, yeah, so these are the two places where I worked and uh, where this work was done. And this is what I consider one very important uh, paper in the history of neuroscience. You see 1744, uh, observations on which one tries to discover the part of the brain where the soul exerts its functions. This is a surgeon of Louis XV of France, bringing a number of behavioral and neuropathological cases, showing that the mind, that is really what they meant by soul in that century, that the mind disappears, so very severely affected when there are specific lesions in the brain. And the specific lesions in the brain were in the corpus callosum. Oops were in the corpus callosum. So all the patients with a lesion in the corpus callosum were losing their soul one way or the other. This notion was controversial. Not everybody accepted it. I think we should accept it for the following reason, that is bring emphasis for the first time probably on the importance of the white matter tracts in fundamental brain functions. And I in the, for the rest of the talk, I will be focusing on axons and not on neurons. And the beginning of this work was serendipitous observation that if you inject in the macaque monkey different uh, parts of the, of the cortex, uh, you will find that there are axons of different diameters. So you find thin axons originating from prefrontal cortex, and you find thick axons originating from motor cortex. And when this work was followed up, before I go there, I, before I like to answer this question, whether the axon diameters really matter for something, and the answer I believe it is yes, for several reasons. First of all, there may be specific pathologies. There are definitely specific pathologies which affect um, different uh, axonal diameters. And this work by Zikopoulos and Barbas, which generated some of the best EM in human that I am aware of, also shows that in the autistic children, you have a fewer large axons in the white matter underlying the medial prefrontal cortex of humans, and you have more thinner axons in the gray matter in the same part of the brain. This is not the only example of pathologies affecting specifically certain axonal diameters. The second reason is that there is a a linear relationship between the cell body size, these are retrogradely injected neurons in the motor cortex of a monkey or in the prefrontal cortex of a monkey, and there is a linear relationship between the uh, axon diameter and the soma size. This is not a new discovery. Actually, um, uh, Alan Peters said something similar many uh, years uh, earlier. But I find uh, this interesting, particularly in, in relation with what I've learned this morning, that larger neurons may have actually different response, uh, uh, different processing properties than small neurons. Another property which is different in large and in small axons is that you can go and, and measure the diameter of and the density of synaptic boutons in in different axonal populations. So you have here the thick axons and the thin axons, and you can measure the, the diameter of the, uh, axon, of the boutons, which are terminal boutons, and the boutons, which are en passant boutons, and you find out that the, for both types of neurons, uh, there are larger boutons on the thick uh, axons than on the thin axons. And this probably means that the thick axons are releasing more neurotransmitter and they're more, they're more effective in, in transferring information. But the main focus of my interest is the fact that there is a relationship 
between conduction velocity uh, and uh, diameter of axons. And perhaps there is also a relationship between the spike frequency, which is transported by thick axons, which would be higher uh, um, frequency of spikes than on thin axons. And this is based on the work on Perge et al. Of course, we know that there is this relationship, been known this relationship for a long time. There is a, a linear relationship between fiber diameter and conduction velocity for myelinated axons. And therefore, you can, on the uh, basis of, of this relationship, try to calculate conduction velocity and on the basis of the length of the connections, conduction delays for the different uh, systems of axons. There is a very well-established relationship between conduction velocities and functional properties in the peripheral nervous system. It led to the Nobel Prize to uh, Gasser. And, and of course, you know that if you go for the afferent fibers uh, or, or peripheral fibers in general, you find large axons with large conduction velocities having to do with primary muscle spindle afferents, cutaneous touch, etc., and small axons having to do with pain. So what is the situation with the central nervous system actions? And I have devoted this slide to actually Eden Segev, because axons are like cables, are performing computational operations. And I actually think that on this, all these neurons that we saw outside this building, there are relatively few axons. How comes there are so few axons, you know? You should have put more axons there. Uh, yeah, do that, please. I, I, I think you should. So the, the kind of operations which, uh, the, that the actions do are in various domains. I don't want to enter into this. But what I want to draw your attention is the temporal domain. Because of the conduction velocity properties, you have faster conducting actions and more slowly conducting actions. Then things happen in the temporal domain, a determination of these axonal arbors as well. But we will not go into that. You will ask. He then what he thinks about it later on. Now, there are some principles in the organization of cortical connections. So different action diameters conduct velocities and, and generate different delays from different areas. Each projection consists of a spectrum of action diameter and therefore conduction delays. Mainly few large axons are added to a projection in development and in evolution. I will come to that toward the end of the talk. The increase of action diameter keeps up with increased brain volume only up to, roughly speaking, Australopithecus, and I will come to that too. And therefore, conduction delays and their dispersion increases in the human brain. And that this may be a human track that we have to understand, and I, I, I will present you the evidence later on. Now, this is my version of the connectome. So you have you know, different areas originating different axons. And the thickness of this arrow is proportional to the median diameter of this axonal projection. And the number here relates to the calculated conduction velocities in that particular projection. And, and what this uh, slide tells you is that if you look into the corpus callosum, you have different uh, diameters of axons going in with different uh, you know, uh, thicknesses. And the same uh, applies to other projections. For example, the projection to the striatum that we will also mention a little bit later, it is done by relatively thin axons. So is the projection to the thalamic nuclei. Some projections to the internal capsule, particularly those originating from area four, are done by very uh, thick axons conducting at very high velocity. And if we have to draw a general kind of message from this kind of distribution, the message is that there is an advantage for actions which are involved in motor or somatosensory functions. You have these thick actions, fast conducting from area four and conducting fast to the corpus callosum, but also from the premotor cortex area six, also conducting fast to the internal capsule and being faster than other actions in going into the thalamus. This also applies to projections from, from area two in the monkey. How is it for humans? And of course, you cannot inject the tracers, and you cannot do these kind of things that we anatomists like to do. But here, a bunch of colleagues in, in Lausanne, at the VFL in Lausanne, 
they are, are using diffusion tractography. And so this study went in the following way, that we subdivided the corpus callosum in 11 partitions. From each of these partitions, streamlines were generated, which were going to the contralateral, which were going to the hemisphere. And you see, what I find really nice, and I had seen it only earlier in, in a work done by a former collaborator of mine, Nakamura, in CATS, is that the callosal connection to the hemisphere is organized in some kind of bands, which are almost metameric organization, and which project to the surface of the cortex in this kind of slabs. So there is a very nice orderly topography in the callosal projection in the monkey, as it is found in the cat. If you then go for the axon diameters of these projections, which we can now calculate, we can calculate these axon diameters by using an extension of the COMMIT program, which was generated by the Ducian collaborators long time ago. And we can have different colors for different diameters. These diameters are, are fairly large. I will show you in a moment why. But what you see is that rather as we had seen in the monkey, you have faster axons going to pre-central gyrus, to post-central gyrus, and then you have progressively thinner axons going to pre-motor cortex and even thinner axon going in prefrontal, uh, streamlines, I should say, excuse me, streamlines going to the prefrontal cortex and uh, something in between to the temporal cortex. Uh, if you go into the corpus callosum of human, by and large, you find really lousy tissue. And, and this is no exception in our situation. You know, you find a lot of holes. You find the axons which are partially destroyed. But you can also recognize uh, a certain number of intact axons. And you can measure the diameter of these intact axons. You have to select these. And it is actually rather you know, disturbing to have to select manually things like this. But what it is nice in our work is that two samples done in the same location, in the same slide of, corte of the corpus callosum 10 years ago and, and a few weeks ago came to exactly the same uh, numbers. So we are safe that at least the, the observation uh, was consistent. Now, if you compare now the kind of estimates that we have obtained in three uh, patients, and I should say that this was work done with uh, the, the connectome uh, machine, which is uh, um, uh, in the hands of um, Derek Jones at Cardiff. Three subjects compared to the human histology on the preparation that I've shown you before, where the human histology, the measurement of axons, is not done in number, in, 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 in size for in terms of size of number of axons, but in terms of volume that axons of different diameters occupy, which gives different uh, sort of, of, of values, actually, it tends to shift a little bit the values which are calculated to the right, you find a rather similar distribution in the locations where we have distology and in locations where we have the diffusion MRI, particularly nice if you, el if you eliminate the small axons which are really not seen by the diffusion MRI the machines. So if you eliminate axons, if, if, if you keep only axons between 2 microns and 6.5 microns, you have values uh, which uh, are, are from the MRI very close to the axons which are uh, measured by the diffusion uh, tractography. Um, it is not the only part of the brain where there are axons of different diameters. And you see here another situation Injections going to, uh, axons going to the brainstem from the premotor cortex, somatosensory, motor area, four, and parietal, uh, uh, parietal cortex. And the distribution in the monkey is like this. You have, again, bigger and faster axons going toward the spinal cord, thinner axons going from prefrontal cortex, from, from premotor cortex, and thinner axons also going from area two, Actually, this might be an artifact due to the relatively small sample we have. And then you see distribution from SMA and from the, uh, from the uh, parietal uh, cortex. Uh, this gives this kind of uh, diagram, again, where we have um, thicker and faster axons 
from area four, from the anterior part of area four, a little bit less from posterior part of area four, which are two different motor areas. Very thin actions going from prefrontal, um, from premotor cortex, F4, and then from A2, and then something in between from the parietal cortex. How is it for the, for if we do it with diffusion MRI? Well, this you have already seen is the corpus callosum. This is a similar study done partitioning the internal capsule in different locations. You see that here again you have streamlines uh, uh, terminating, going up and, and going into the hemisphere, and terminating uh, in, from this central sector in particular, terminating in the precentral and part of the postcentral gyrus. And if we go for the um, conduct for the axonal diameters here, this you have already seen is for the corpus callosum. This is for the internal capsule, and you see again that you have thick actions in one part of area four, the dorsal part, and then you also have thick actions actually for, for, for the somatosensory cortex here. When you look forward to premotor cortex or to prefrontal cortex, you get thinner actions, and the same thing if you go into, um, into parietal cortex. Why is it that there is this sort of preference for fast actions in motor cortex and somatosensory cortex. And one possible explanation that I want to give to you is that it may have something to do with the body ownership feeling. So the brain has to learn that this body is his body, and probably the main cues it has come from the fact that he can move this body with using motor cortical connections, or it can have feelings for this body using the somatosensory connections. That is, of course, highly hypothetical. Now, I want to now show something different, which is, uh, you know, it, so far things look rather similar between uh, monkey and, uh, and humans, but if you look at this from a different point of view, they are not so similar. And this is what uh, we have done uh, in, in this paper, which was published in PNS some, uh, some years ago. Um, in, in this diagram, there are corpus callosum axons seen from the midline in the macaque, chimpanzee, and human. The chimpanzee were coming from, uh, from Patrikov in New York. And there were three cases for each species. And you see here the distribution of action diameters in the chimp, in human, and, uh, and, uh, and in, in human. So it is so that the action diameter increases from macaque to the chimpanzee due to the addition of large axons. So, what evolution does here is not to increase all the axons proportionally to the expansion of the brain, but it increases only some, it adds to the distribution only some axons, which are down here, and it adds axons to the chimpanzee, and no more axons are added in, in the human case. So the, what, what this means that is that our brain has conserved an axonal uh, 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 population here, which would have been appropriate for a brain of about 450 cubic centimeters, which is the, the volume of the brain of the chimpanzee, and it is also the volume of the brain of Australopithecus, but then it didn't keep up any further. And the consequence is that we have slower connectivity and dispersed conduction delays in the human brain. And this is what this uh, uh, sh shows to you is that if you go from, in any part of the corpus callosum you study, if you go from the macaque to the shim to the human, you find that in the human there is a conduction delay increased, and there is also an increased dispersion of conduction delays. Now, the increased conduction delay has been taken from, by a relatively uh, well, uh, you know, uh, um, well known uh, theory, is evidence that it might have driven, the fact that conduction between the hemispheres becomes slower, it might have been a reason for specializing the two hemispheres. And that is why I was discussing yesterday afternoon whether, you know, how, how this would be possible. And we don't know anything about the, um, actually, the consequences of this increased sp spread of conduction delays. This might actually favor some sort of slow processes in the human brain 
such as the processes that you might need in order to use language. Now, we don't know what we have gained by, by, by having these changes in, in connectivity, uh, but we know what we have avoided. And I think Chris has already uh, pointed to this. We have avoided an enormous increase of the brain, uh, which would have made our life relatively difficult and also our birth relatively difficult. Now, the, what I've told you very quickly is not the only difference that we find between the human and the macaque brain. And another uh, difference that we find is this. There are connections between the cortex of one hemisphere and the striatum on the other side. And this connection may be useful for certain things. And when you look at the monkey, these connections are restricted to the anterior part of the corpus callosum because they originate specifically from areas which are rostrally in the brain. If you go into the human brain, you find that these connections originate also from more posterior part, like the presplenial part here, which connects the inferior parietal lobule. And the question is, is this connection real? You know, we, in, because the, the diffusion tratography generates a large number of artifacts of connections which are not there, it was rather, uh, 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 it was rather difficult for us to swallow that there might be a connection in the human brain which is not seen in the macaque brain. And at the end, we have accepted that this connection might exist because the areas where this projection originates uh, is, parietal, is lower parietal cortex, which is, in, 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 uh, which is involved in language processing. And then the region where they cross in the corpus callosum is also a region that has been reported by Angela Frederici, a case of patients with lesions in, uh, in this part of the corpus callosum, um, having, having difficulties uh, with uh, certain aspects of language processing. So maybe this connection exists. I'm looking forward to somebody who will confirm or, or actually reject this hypothesis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We can take one question. Did you look into diversity between uh, different humans when it comes to the white matter? Because there is some literature on gender differences, but I couldn't find any conclusion. So. Uh, that is really what I hope will come out of these uh, studies with diffusion photography, you know, differences between humans, uh, particularly for humans, for example, with different uh, skills. A lot has been said about musicians having, uh, you know, differences in, in among other uh, re areas in the corpus callosum. And uh, I, I think that uh, the fractional anisotropy, which has been used to differentiate this, or also in, in the case of dyslexia, uh, functional anisotropy differences in the arcuate fasciculus do not tell us exactly what is going on. They just tell us that there is something to be studied there. So I, I hope that this, and that is why I am very excited about these techniques, is that although I, I didn't point clearly out that, you know, with diffusion photography we can measure axon diameters uh, larger than 1.5 or 2 microns. So a large part of axon diameters are escaping because the, in, in the very um, being of those very small axons, the, 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 the diffusion photography becomes rather undetermined. You can find their large or small axon or no axons at all. Nevertheless, being able to reconstruct the large axons already, it would be a tremendous advantage because we may find out that certain projections, which should not have large axons, have large axons, or certain, like these kids that we are listening to, you know, when I was listening to the concert yesterday afternoon, I was taken by the beauty of that music, and at the same time, by the idea that here there is a population of kids who would be nice to study for their... <laughs> <laughs> around the central sulcus would hold for non-primate mammals since we are so, uh, since primates are very uh, strong with our hands. Um, they are, it, you know, it's, it's, dif it's difficult to, to compare things exactly because these studies with traces have not been done as far as I know in, on, in on primate mammals. 
Nevertheless, the corpus callosum shows in, in rats and also, I believe, in mice, larger actions in the central body, the mid-body of the corpus callosum, where these actions are probably cursing. And so I, I, I believe that one can, uh, yeah. And I've seen myself uh, sm extremely small actions in the genome of the corpus callosum of the mouse, where actions uh, connecting prefrontal cortex are, are coursing. And there is a lot of unmyelinated actions there. You know, this leads me to, to say, probably the mouse and the rat, which are so useful for a number of things, are not the best animal to use in diffusion tratography because most of their connectivity will uh, fall below the threshold uh, currently uh, possible for that B beautiful technique, by the way. It's a technique that I admire enormously. The idea of being able to, you know, to measure actions in humans, alive, quickly, et cetera, and, 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 and track the connections is something like a dream. You know, when I started doing uh, diffusion photography with my colleagues in Lausanne, where you kind of push on a button and you have a connection that in a monkey or in any species would have taken you, you know, months of work. And we know that that connection may be false to some extent, but we also know that the community is extremely smart and extremely active trying to eliminate all these artifacts one after the other. So I believe the future is there. What about the blue whale? Do they have to take every of corpus callosum or the dolphin? How much is known about that? Well, I mean, my former, you know, postdoc, Paul Manger, is interested in dolphins and, and in elephants. And he has collected brains of these species. But to the best of my knowledge, he has not injected these animals. But probably the corpus callosum of those species should become available at some point. But uh, at the moment, I don't know anything about it. Okay, thank you very much.